We're here today to have a dialogue about uh, movement strategy, talk about some matters of common interest that maybe will interest you. Well, we've been trying to plan this for six months, haven't we? <laughs> so we've finally done it. Let's move on to how political change actually works and how it's probably going to work in a crisis, in an existential emergency. So where I disagree with you here is partially from the studies I've done, but partially from what I pick up, and this is a bit of a theoretical point, I suppose, but is when, when, a, when a society is fundamentally on the wrong track, economically, socially, spiritually, mm -hmm. it's basically heading for a fall. Yeah. And I don't want you to misunderstand me here by, you know, I'm a revolutionary because of the context, right? I'm not a revolutionary because revolution's always right. Like, in the 1990s, forget it. There's not a chance in a million years of a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Reformism is where it's at, you know, mm -hmm. go and join Greenpeace. In 2022, my proposition is we, we're in a revolutionary period. It's deterministic in the sense that We've got this big juggernaut out there. Mm. This is one of the things we're sort of, a lot of activists are in denial about. This, one of the reasons we've been so, so unsuccessful is not because we've been rubbish, it's because what we're facing is so completely systemic. Mm. Yeah. You know, again, economically, politically, socially, culturally, spiritually. It's like, you, you know, you can look at elements there where you've got this hegemonic force which is taking us over the cliff. You've got capitalism, you've got the culture of growth, You've got individualism, you've got, you know, the alienation from any form of collective action. You know, all these things come together. So what I'm saying sociologically is that it's not going to happen gradually, mm -hmm. right? In this particular context, it's, what's going to happen is there's going to be a massive explosion through this intense social repression that now a large proportion of the population realises, either consciously or subconsciously. Mm -hmm. They sort of know. And, and one sign of that, of an, empirical, an empirical sign of that, is I'm disputing that there aren't people out there who are engaged in civil resistance. Of course there are. The question is, ha the question is how many? The question is one of orders of magnitude, right? That's yeah. the question I'm asking. Of course, I, I completely agree with you that um, we're heading uh, off a cliff. In fact, the way I like to put it now is we're already off the cliff. We, most people don't realise that yet. We've got to try to stop our, our tumbling down. We've got to try to clamber back up. And I completely agree with you that, as I like to put it, this civilization is finished. The only question is, how does it end? Does it end by, by continuing the crash, which is most likely? Or do we manage to, to find some way of pulling it back up again, which is going to involve, as you say, um, a complete um, systems level transformation. It's going to involve a paradigm shift. Um, and that paradigm, a paradigm shift is coming. You know, the paradigm shift will either come deliberately through concerted action and, and multi-level change, or it'll come accidentally uh, through collapse, which is what we're on uh, course for. Um, but yeah, the, the issue is, well, one, way, one very some simple way of putting the issue is, do we have the, the numbers uh, yet for the, for the mode of that transformation which you're envisaging? Another way, slightly more subtle of putting the, the question is, if we again go back to, to, to Chenoweth, um, one of the things that she's quite clear about, but which people haven't necessarily always picked up on as much, is that uh, even once you have 3.5%, which is millions of people in a country like the UK, um, you also need a far larger plurality behind that which, who are broadly supportive. If you have 3.5% for you and 96.5% against, you're completely fucked. You know, there's no way you win yeah, yeah, in that yeah. situation. Right. So part of what I'm talking about is how do we actually get to millions? And I'm suggesting that my strategy may be more likely to achieve that. And another part of it is how do we get the sort of, it's not exactly a long tail, it's the kind of supportive underbelly. I sometimes use the metaphor of an iceberg, you know. You've got really uh, radical resistors on the top. You've got maybe a, a huge uh, moderate flank below that, as it were. Um, and uh, then below the waterline, you still need a lot more people broadly on side, otherwise you're still gonna lose. Right, so, well, let's take those one step at a time, right? So number one, like, your proposition is there's not enough people 
arguably, right, to engage in civil resistance? That's like an empirical question. Mm -hmm. You know, are there or aren't there? You know, <laughs> let's go and have a look out yeah. the window. Yeah. Okay, so I've got strong empirical evidence there are, right, in the sense that if I go, and, you know, I've done like, I do four or five meetings a week, right, mm -hmm. public meetings. So I've got my finger on the pulse mm -hmm. of the XR movement and the public more generally. To, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's conclusive data, obviously, but um, if, we, if we do a, a talk, two or three people will agree to do civil disobedience, either to be arrested several times or even potentially go to prison. Mm -hmm. So you can do the maths, right? Mm -hmm. We know from the top judiciary and government insiders that there is, uh, there is a point, let's concretise it, there is a point of creating legislative change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that happens all the time. It happened in the BLM protests, you know, with Minnesota saying they were going to respond to police reform. We saw it in France when they withdrew the diesel price increase, you know, in 2018, was it? Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it's not really on many people's radar, but thousands of people went to the motorways, dare I say it, in Serbia, like about five weeks ago, on two Saturdays, and they reversed a whole series of legislation by the Serbian government to allow multinationals to rip up the country for mining rights, mm. right? So we know this is how political change works, right? So my, pro my proposition to you, and you know, I'm involved in Just Stop Oil, and my observations, as I said to you the other day, is there could be, you know, could be, <laughs> let's mm. say, there could be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people engaged in civil disobedience this spring. Yeah which puts us in the ballpark of forcing the government to engage in legislative change, right? That, that's, that's the first, the first mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing is, the second thing is how, you know, you raise a legitimate point, which is how do you actually bring the 70% of the population along yeah. with you? Yeah. So what we also know, what we also know is when you have a moral issue which is objective, as it were, like slavery or, mm -hmm. you know, re right, racial rights or Hitler or these things, is one, once a small proportion of a society enters into resistance, you get a rapid flipping effect, assuming it remains nonviolent. As a general rule, you know, this isn't determinism, but as a general rule, you will find a whole load of people very quickly changing as a result of your radical flank scenario, which I'm not calling it radical flank, right? I'm calling it, you know, your moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. in, in order, for instance, like in 1961, you know, Martin Luther King was the most unpopular man in America. They didn't, their strategy wasn't to go to white liberals and say, let's set up some more nice liberal organizations. What their strategy was, was full on, full, full pelt, mass civil, disobedience, mm. focusing on creating high-level political conflict, involving people dying, mm. involving violence. That was the strategy in order to expose that obscene racism. Mm -hmm. And during those five years, that radical flank, inverted commas, strategy created a new zeitgeist, a new normal in, in American society that racism was unacceptable. Yeah. As, as the, what you might call the national consensus, mm. right? Everyone knows that didn't solve the whole thing, but let's not be black and white about it, it's substantive change in American yeah. culture, right? So the, what I see happening with the climate is what happened in the 60s on steroids. <laughs> because mm. what, we're facing, what we're facing with the climate is not the obscenity of the treatment of 11 million black Americans. We're dealing with the obscenity of the willful murder and destruction of billions of people. Absolutely, yeah. And, and so that's, I'm trying to be contextual, you see what I mean? I'm not trying to say yeah. this is always how it happens. I totally take your point that often, you know, in normal politics you build an alliance, but in this situation, you have to pursue this this is the strategy that these people watching need to pursue. Because the other point is, is it, you know, there's this self-fulfilling thing that you're on this video and you say, well, guys, we need to do a moderate flank. Then that encourages people to not get to that critical mass. And that's where it becomes quite unpleasant because it's a bit like, you know, there's a well, moral issue there. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the way I would put that is, is less like that. I would say... Um 
you know, I hope, as we said at the start, that we're in, a, we're in a spirit of potential conviviality here. And I think what is certainly clear is that we need, if you will, a kind of balanced movement uh, ecosystem that enables people to find uh, spaces in it that they are comfortable with and to move from one to another. So you've mentioned like people in the judiciary and so on. You know, I think it'd be fantastic if some of them came out and did uh, civil disobedience uh, next week. But I don't think that's very likely. But I think there are things that they could do that'd be really helpful that we can encourage them to do, which are you know, somewhere on a kind of a, a, a spectrum. I mean, in terms of the numbers question, so in terms of Just Stop Oil, I'm really encouraged by what I've heard so far about Just Stop Oil. It sounds to me as though some of the lessons of some of the things which haven't gone so well in the last few years in um, XR uh, and in um, Insulate Britain and so on may have been learnt. I think it will make more sense to people to focus on um, the, what is in a certain sense the real cause of the trouble, i.e. fossil fuels. Um, I think if you've got the kind of numbers that you're talking about, you may be able to do uh, mass nonviolent uh, direct action um, uh, against um, uh, that, it, that industry uh, in a way which will make sense to people and which will be uh, successful and which will be dramatic and which will encourage real change. Real change. I hope all that happens. If it happens in that kind of way, um, I'll, be, uh, I'll, be, I'll be there to support it uh, totally. But I would make a couple of points um, uh, beyond that. One is um, you're saying you're going to have thousands of people. That's brilliant. But that isn't millions of people, let alone uh, tens of millions of people uh, in broad support. And then you say, well, yeah, but we're going to get this kind of flipping effect. But then we come to the point that this issue, I mean, it's not even an issue what we're talking about. You know, it's a total, as we said, it's a total crisis of civilization. Um, the, the analogies with past struggles are, are problematic. And that's one of the things I try to argue in this little well, a little advert here. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion insights Make from the inside. Look. Yeah, <laughs> oh, um, got one. <laughs> uh, which responds, among other things, to to your uh, to your uh, common sense for the twenty first century uh, uh, pamphlet. One of the arguments I make in that book is um, a crucial difference between our situation and the situation of the civil rights movement in the sixty. You say, you know, our situation is a lot worse. It's a much more objective, bigger crisis. I completely agree. But most people, but A, most people still don't really at a deep level understand that. And I think we have to do things to bring them to understand that rather than hoping that they can arrive instantly sort of at the end of the journey. Uh, and, uh, and B, um, there is a massive difference between how easy it is for power to concede our demands. Right. So at the end of the day, um, there were, there were intelligent people in the US federal government who understood, look, actually, we can bring black people um, into this system uh, and bring them into our democracy and bring them more fully into the economic system. And it doesn't really fundamentally change the things that we want, the things that we need, the things that we take for granted. The corporations, um, the elites, uh, the big money, they all know that the things that we want to do uh, are in some sense, in the short to medium term, going to be bad uh, for them. Um, and a lot of ordinary people are aware that even if that might not be true, then it is true that you know, a lot of things are going to have to change. It's not just that renewable energy is going to um, uh, say is going to replace, you know, jewel for jewel, the energy that we get from fossil fuels. No, you know, the future, if there's going to be a future, is going to be a future where there is less tra less air travel. It's going to be a future where there is much more local food growing and many more people on the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This civilization is finished. The transformation is going to have to be profound, wide, and deep. So it's far more difficult to get what we want and what we need than it was for, for Martin Luther King uh, et al. And for that reason, I think we have to be uh, uh, honest enough and strategic enough to try to find ways of bringing broad masses of people on this journey. This is not the kind of transformation that can be imposed from top down. This is my reason for differing with so-called eco-Leninists like Andreas Malm, who you know, is a sort of one step further on the radical spectrum, if you will, than your, than your good self. Um, I think that it is completely implausible to think that we could succeed um, in taking the, uh, the, the reins of power and imposing the kind of change that is necessary uh, on the populace uh, at large. We have 
to bring most people with us. Otherwise, this will not will not happen. It's a civilization level transformation. Yeah. And that's why I think strategies that are thinking, okay, yeah, how do we get to, um, the envelope being pushed uh, by, by radical action? And how do we have a big broad swave that comes along actively, seriously behind that? And how do we keep on board the broad mass of the population? You can have some people against you, but if you end up having 60, 70, 80% of people against you, you're fucked. Yeah, well, we both agree about that, right? So what, what potentially we disagree about is what's the method of change? And what, what I'm saying is, 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 and I'm 100% certain on this, dare I say it, which is it's not going to be pretty, right? It's not going to be rational in the sense of, Let's sit down and give people more information. No, sure. Right. There's the being what you might call the moderate flank approach for you know the last thirty years. So let me just just be clear, quick clarification. Um, I'm calling for, and I see starting to emerge a new uh, potentially mass distributed moderate flank. These organisations I named before, right? These are new. I'm not saying you know let's just accept, let's just go with the traditional NGOs. I'm talking no. about people who are trying to do stuff. You know, I'm talking about people like the lawyers for net zero type thing, for example. They want to eventually get to a point where lawyers are doing things like saying um, you shouldn't do that because uh, you run the risk of uh, of being sued in future. We're not going to take this client because they've got these. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and at every level, they're pressing. You know, one of the reasons why the law is a good is a good uh, is a good institution to press through is it's it's one of those sort of points in society which. Um, which everything sort of has to pass through, you know? And if you start to get lawyers and then, you know, as we, as we were saying earlier, the judici judici judiciary yeah. asking awkward questions and, and not going along with power and so on, well, then you're really, you're really getting somewhere. Yeah. So, so I'm not at all saying, oh, you know, let's go back to the, the old kind of 1990s uh, uh, approach. I'm saying, let's exploit but, the success of XR right. to move as far as we can yeah. without frightening all the horses uh, behind um, the uh, change in consciousness that has been c created yeah. so far. Well, what I think we need to do is concretize these generalities a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're going to talk to lawyers. What is, you know, we're going to get lawyers on our side. What does this concretely mean? So what I'm saying is, is there's two failed paradigms of change, right? One is information provision. Yeah. I'm going to the lawyers, I'm going to tell them that 1.5 is done, blah, 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 right? And the other one is persuasion and argument. Like, I'm going to go to the lawyers and I'm going to make an argument, right? Now, both of those have functionality when you're not dealing with major personal change. You know, I can say, you know, do you want to go and do the washing up? I'll give you information. There's lots of washing up to be done and I'll <laughs> suggest that it's your turn, right? And you'll go and do it because it's not a big deal. Mm. But if you're a sudden racist in 1961, I can argue with you until the cows come home, literally, and you're not going to change because it's a fundamental part of your identity that you, are, you have a right under God, under state rights, to dominate and exploit black people. You're not going to change, right? And what the black, you know, the black rights movement did, as mm. you know, for 90 years, they had this, this approach and they got absolutely nowhere. Mm. And in 1958, there was this explosion of civil disobedience. And suddenly there was a glimmer, like we've seen with XR, there's this glimmer of actually, this is how it works. We're not saying it definitely will work, but what we are saying is, is information and rational argument is definitely not going to work, right? Yeah. As much as, you know, there is a sociological law about it. When you're dealing with entrenched power, Mm -hmm. And what we're absolutely dealing with here is entrenched power. Not in some reductive Marxist, you know, we're the oppressors and we're pushing you down. Obviously, there's an element of that, but it's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's cultural and spiritual mm -hmm. and it, it's, a, it's a way of being, isn't it? Like the mm -hmm. Southern way of life. It's like mm -hmm. we yeah. are provided with this supremacism because of religious fundamental core reasons. So this society out, out there has this fundamental arrogance that we can destroy nature because nature means nothing. And we have this right to continually produce. Yeah. And, you know, everyone yeah. sort of knows now that it's done. But they still, you know, mm. you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so 
the, the transformation, the only thing on the cards, and I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's 100% will work, but I'm trying, we're talking pragmatically here, right? Yeah, yeah. We've got two strategies. So we've got to compare them. But for the sake of argument, there's a 50, 60% chance that when you engage in civil resistance, you throw the dice on saying to the population, we can't carry on like this. And that population changes really rapidly. And this, there's two, there's two sort of theories of change here. So let's just identify. Mm -hmm. One theory of change is, is, you know, you have the advertising campaign, you change people's attitudes, it's information, right? And then the, another theory of change is, is what you might call Freudian-esque. I don't want to get into Freud, you know, in terms of what he was particularly saying. But what I'm trying to say is, is you disagree with me. So empirically, it looks like you disagree with me, but deeper down, mm -hmm. you actually yeah, know yeah, I'm yeah. right, yeah. right? And we know in our personal relationships and family relationships, when someone's doing mm. something wrong, often they're really aggressive yeah, yeah. before they decide that actually you were right. Yeah. And this is a, so there's a fundamental difference of analysis. So when people talk about Insulate Britain, they go, well, you're upsetting people. So their paradigm is, if you upset people, they're less, you know, you're pushing them away. But there's another analysis, which means you're upsetting people because they're out to flip and agree with you. Now, those yeah. are two very different <laughs> interpretations of the same empirical data. Sure. And I'm, I'm not saying that one is absolutely right and one's absolutely wrong. But my argument is in this particular context, unless, unless people go through this period of emotional turmoil, they're not actually going to change in mm -hmm. the same way as you've got to shout at a teenager mm -hmm. to do the washing up. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. because the rational argument isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Now, just to, just to complete this sure. point is, as, as I think we both agree on this, this is why it's absolutely essential that the civil resistance is non-violent. Yeah. But more yeah. than just non-violent, it has to be dialogical. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's mm -hmm. not like, it can't be just pragmatic, oh, we're not, you know, we're not going to be violent because you know, it works. It has to be deeper than that. There has to be a, 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 an, a, a spiritual-esque, yeah realization that humanity is has fundamental commonalities every mm. human being has a fundamental commonality mm -hmm. and when you go and talk to your opponent mm -hmm. they're fundamentally human mm -hmm. and i don't mean this in some hippie way i mean i mean in the sense that it's actually biologically socially and culturally the case mm. because mm. we all know and the literature is full of this is you can sit down with someone and within five minutes you made some connection, right? Mm. Because there's more to life than political conflict, right? Yeah. So I think that having that thing that XR brought into the climate yeah. movement is yeah. essential. And this is one of the best things about XR. Mm. And you know, I've got plenty of criticisms of XR, but one of the fantastic things about XR was in its very imperfect way, it was actually trying to transform the way we do human relations, yeah. both was. inside the movement, but potentially how we actually treat the opposition. Yeah. It was, it was, in a sense, and, was... and and the general population, yeah, and and it's that, it's that, there's that two sided thing, which is yes, we're disrupting you, and you're getting emotional, and we're also being respectful in our communication to provide you with this face saving way in which you can make that division, yeah. and that's of course the stupidity of the violent approach, yeah, which is yeah, you win, you know, you win the war, but you lose the peace, mm. you know, nice, and, yeah, you know, you see that in Iraq. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. In that sense, XR was was beautiful. It was it was prefigurative, uh, and it was modelling this kind of um, civil model of how you do disagreement. Yeah. And I want to see more of that in future. I don't people. I don't think people felt that quite as much with uh, with Insulate Britain, and I'm very sceptical that Insulate Britain has helped people reach this point of kind of flipping. Um, I think, as I said, that Just Stop Oil may stand a much better chance of doing that. But can I say a little bit more about my theory of change in the current context, mm. uh, for example, because it's not as you characterized it. So what I think, and I suspect we agree on this, is that a, a key part of, of, of my theory of change in terms of where we are now um, is that we've got to keep absolutely radically telling the truth. 
And we've got to keep um, being authentic about that, which includes being emotional about it. Uh, and that's one of the key ways in which it's not the old kind of information model, right? Uh, it's about being um, willing to, to do the kinds of things that you know, both you and I and other of our colleagues have done on, on cameras, you know, our, our voices breaking, turning directly to the lens, addressing the interviewer directly and saying that, that aren't you personally worried about this? Don't you, you know, do you have children yourself? All these kinds of things. Um, and if we do that kind of stuff, that can help us break through to some extent. Going further than that, what I passionately believe and what is again described in, in this little beauty is, um, is that we've got to get people deeper into the sense of their vulnerability and their children's vulnerability, that they're not far enough into that yet, most people, to really, you know, most people have now got to the stage that they're willing to answer a question in an opinion poll is climate one of the most important issues facing us today? With the answer, yes. And that's real progress, and that's a lot the result of XR. But most people have not really got to the point where they're willing to, to say, maybe a lot of them feel it, but, but, but they're willing to say, I really fear for my uh, child's life uh, and future, and I understand that climate disasters may well be coming to take them during the next 10, 20, 30 years, or that there may be um, massive food scarcity, that we could get multi-bread basket failures. Most people have not got to that stage yet. And I think we need to take them on a journey to that, which involves multiple dimensions. I think it involves um, uh, continued uh, work, such as the work that Just Stop Oil are gonna try to do. And I, th I think it involves uh, work on a whole load of other dimensions. So in terms of what, uh, I'm hoping is going to happen through the moderate flank and what I'm seeing start to happen. Uh, it's, it's taking that spirit and applying it in all the key locales of our society. And the two which I identify as most important are our workplaces and our real local geographical communities. So in our workplaces, to take an example, the kind of thing I'm saying is what we need people to do is not just go around saying this stuff, but saying it um, and experiencing it in an emotional way, projecting it into scenarios for what could happen, and then drawing the consequences of that in terms of what ought to happen in their workplace. And what, what does that mean? So it means everything from, you know, what the hell are we doing still commuting to work, to what are we doing with our profits? Are we actually making the world a better place with them? Uh, to what's our supply chain? You know, is it carbon heavy? Does it have, uh, uh, does it have long uh, miles? Um, is it resilient? Um, are we thinking about how it's going to stand up um, uh, in the years ahead? And then taking action to change every one of those things in whichever way you can do that, whether that be through a trades union or through a professional association or through talking to your employer or through just starting to make uh, changes or through threatening to uh, withdraw your labor um, if, uh, if those kinds of changes are not, uh, are not met. And if that kind of thing were to start happening, taking action in those kind of ways uh, in every single uh, workplace, especially the ones that, that really have the strongest leverage, places like uh, the law and uh, audit and uh, insurance and so forth. If that were to start happening across the, across the shop, that I believe would be transformative and that I can see involving millions of people. So that's my vision of change.